everybody. Welcome to your capital. What's up? I'm Chuck Wieger, your area state senator. Thank you very much for watching. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me Gene Mamagay of Maplewood. Welcome to our show, Gene. Thank you very much, Senator. Gene, you've had many titles over the years. Uh, professor, teacher, commissioner of education. Uh, you were a state senator. Uh, among other things, and we're going to reflect on that journey, and uh, I appreciate your being with us today. Well, it's my pleasure. Good. Uh, but tell us first, where did you grow up? I grew up uh, 90 miles west of Chicago, Illinois, in a small prairie town called Oregon, Illinois. Okay. And I uh, went to, uh, I came to Minnesota to finish my, educa my undergraduate education at St. Cloud State. Okay, so you grew up in Illinois. I grew up in Illinois, moved uh, briefly, I thought, to uh, Minnesota to go to school at St. Cloud. It was a, known as a teacher training institution. Before uh, the yes. move to Minnesota, a couple of memories about Illinois? Illinois is a far different state than Minnesota. Uh, Northern Illinois it has very little to do with Southern Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, the capital is way down in Springfield. Nobody ever goes there from Northern Illinois. The big town is Chicago, Illinois, but it was very frightening to those of us who lived in a 2000 population okay. town. We only went to Chicago to see the Chicago Cubs play. Okay. And as soon as the game was over, we left town because, again, the town was so large yeah. and so foreign to us that, uh, that we moved out and got back into the safety okay. of Oregon, Illinois, as soon as we could. We read the Chicago Tribune. And the Chicago Tribune was run, uh, the editor was a man named Colonel McCormick. And Colonel McCormick was an isolationist and a rock rib Republican. Mm -hmm. When you grew up with the Chicago Tribune and grew up in Northern Illinois where I did, you were a Republican. Mm -hmm. The only ex excitement, uh, the only contest in election was the Republican primary. Okay. Because once the Republican primary was over, the, uh, the determination was made in Ogle County, Illinois, where I lived. Okay. We voted we voted the straight Republican ticket. It was a column ballot, and there was one circle at the top of the ballot, for the, for, and you voted for the entire column then. Okay. And my father and mother only went in, and they came out of the, the, the voting booth within seconds. Yes. Because all they had to do was to put that one X at the very top of the Republican for ballot, the and they were done. Okay. And they, they knew they had done the right thing. What did your uh, parents do f for work or My, my father, I, I, I was born in 1931, and I was an only child, which was not unusual. The birth rate beginning in 1929 went way down because of the Great the Depression. Depression. So uh, the... the, the People who simply didn't have children. My father lost a job, mm -hmm. and he started a service station in our front yard. Oh, we, we lived on a highway, a, a, a state highway. Zoning, forget about it, right? He built this little tiny station, and he ran it seven days a week. He, when he woke up in the morning, he went to the service station, he came, he, he left that position at 10 o'clock in the evening. Okay. We survived because of his constant, constant work. Mm -hmm. and, and I grew up in that atmosphere, that, that, that work was a good thing. I also grew up as a Lutheran understanding that that the Protestant work ethic yes. was was very real. So that is, that's that's part of me uh, and, and, and uh, but also I also grew up knowing that I was going to go to school. This is an interesting thing in my memory. 
My father worked so hard in that station to make a living that he was convinced that it would be good for me to go to college. Mm -hmm. And I never had a doubt that my responsibility in the work ethic was to go to school and get high grades so that someday I would go to college. Were you a good student? Oh, I was a perfect student. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Reflect on that a bit. What was your favorite subject or end activity? Well, my favorite subject early on, well, first of all, I like to read. I, yes. I, I just like to read. Uh, uh, almost anything. But I found out early on that I could not sing, for example. Okay. I remember Miss Vivian Holmes putting me in not the bluebird section. <laughs> the bluebird section were those I quickly rather learned that could carry a tune. <laughs> I forget the bird I was, but I, th that was not a career kind of thing. I, I also found out that I could not perform in art. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I, I, I couldn't draw pictures. Okay. And, and so I would ask, I remember asking the teacher if during the art section of elementary school, if I couldn't please just read the, a history book. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to do that. I okay. simply had to show again and again that I couldn't draw. And that, that, seemed, that seemed unfair to me. Mm -hmm. So yes, I was a, I was a good student. And Favorite I, subject, you, you love to read. I love uh, to read. And any particular activity, extracurricular? Oh, I, 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 was, uh, I was an athlete. Okay. I was an athlete for a while. I uh, I was very uh, I was very good at basketball. Okay. Yes, and uh, and and in my freshman and sophomore years in high school, I uh, I was a, a, a high scorer. Okay. On, on the freshman sophomore teams, but unfortunately, at the uh, in the sophomore year about, it seemed as though all the other young men started growing taller. Okay. I did not. I stopped at five feet, five and a half inches tall. And so my junior year, I was on the team again, uh, but I found out then that every time that I started to shoot the ball, some taller person would knock the ball, would block the ball. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. and and I was um, uh, by the by my senior year, I was chosen by the team to be the captain of the team. Okay. Yes, but but the coach would only start me mm -hmm. with my being the captain, shaking hands with the captain of the other team. Mm -hmm. He would play me for about two minutes, and then withdraw me because all those big guys were taking advantage of my shortness. Well, I'm sure you provided motivation and leadership to help the team. Well, let me tell you that our senior year, I think we won two games and lost 18. Okay. So my motivational talent uh, wasn't that great. Okay. I learned, I learned, Senator, I learned how to live with adversity. Okay. Uh, I learned how to accept defeat. Okay. Yes. So growing up, you knew about the Depression, you knew about hard work, that uh, ethic was inculcated in you, you had leadership skills that developed, you uh, decided, though, you are going to venture to Minnesota, St. Cloud. Yes. Uh, and uh, pursue education. Tell us about that chapter as we get into your history in Minnesota. I graduated, Cloud. I, I, I graduated from St. Cloud. I was immediately drafted into the service. What, your major at St. Cloud? I was a double major history and political science. Okay. And then you're drafted? I, I, wanted to, I wanted to teach. 
Yes. I graduated and was drafted. <clears throat> I uh, served in a peacetime military, the Korean conflict. Which branch? Uh, United States Army. Okay, and your I, I, specialty I, area? <laughs> my specialty area. Uh, I, um, again, I, the, the truce was signed in Korea. Yes. One week before I was drafted. Okay. So it was a peacetime service. I took basic military, a uh, basic infantry training. But I have a chip in my knee, the right knee. I was made a profile B, I think it was, okay. and taken, and, and, and I was uh, uh, put into clerk typist training. Mm -hmm. So I learned to, to type well enough to be a, a, a company clerk. Mm -hmm. And I served in southern France as a company clerk in a supply unit there. Mm -hmm. It was an extraordinarily boring time. Okay. Yes. But, uh, nonetheless. But, but it was quite safe. Serving your country, though, uh, responding well, to Well, and wherever I was sent. That was, and that, that's true. Duty called, and so we appreciate it, that. Well, yes. 20, 21 months in the service, came back, taught two years in a small high school out of, out of Kenosha, Wisconsin. Okay. Taught senior social problems, taught American history, taught world history. Okay. I did not enjoy teaching world history. I enjoyed the senior social problems. I enjoyed American history. And I wanted to get out of that little small high school. And the only way I thought I could get out of it was to go to the university and to, uh, to, to uh, get an advanced degree yes. so that I could teach just American history and senior social problems. I went to the University of Minnesota. Good. And I stayed there getting a master's degree and almost getting a doctor's degree. Mm -hmm. And in uh, 1961, after completing all of the classroom work for a doctorate of philosophy degree, I, uh, uh, I needed to get a job. I had become a father. Mm -hmm. I needed to support a small family. And so I looked for work. There were very little work available. Mm -hmm. In history and social studies, yes. it's very hard to find work. And uh, Bemidji, Minnesota, a man left a job up there in the history department in August. Okay. They were in desperate need of somebody to teach American history. As were you. As I was in desperate need of employment. And so I did get the job up there. I went to, their, to Bemidji State in 1961. I had golden years of teaching in a small college, about 1,100. Yes. A college in which when you walk down the, uh, on the campus, you would know almost everybody by face. A college in which every fall faculty would get back together again and have a picnic, an outdoor picnic, yes. up in uh, Lake Bemidji State Park. Mm -hmm. It was very pleasant. Yes. I enjoyed that a great deal. And uh, I, uh, I enjoyed the, the, the pleasures of teaching. But in 19, but I also started uh, 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 volunteering in the Democratic Party. Okay. Oh, uh, let let me do that. Okay. I left in a Republican environment, and I went to college and I took courses in political science and in history. Mm -hmm. And I came to the conclusion that the depression through which I had lived, and that my father's hatred of Franklin D. Roosevelt oh. was that, 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 I, that I took as part of my life. Yes. I became convinced that his view of the, of the New Deal and Franklin Roosevelt was contrary to what I was learning in school. Okay. Did you and confront him with that? My father died the year I graduated from high school. Okay. It was one of the toughest things of my life uh, that when I went to college, which he had insisted that I do, Good. and he with his hard work had provided the wherewithal yes. for me to go to college, that I was not able to come back from college and talk to him okay. about his beliefs mm -hmm. 
and what I had learned in school. Nonetheless, you advanced with your passion and you became involved in the Democratic Party in Bemidji. I did. I was asked to do things like uh, chair the county convention, yep. do that kind of thing. And, and, and in 1966, after a DFL meeting in Beltrami County, I, I walked from the American Legion meeting room yes. that they so kindly provided us. Yes. And I went out into the bar with some friends. And there were three, and I note this particularly, three extremely well-dressed men. Okay. Senator Nick Coleman, who was the minority leader of the DFL in the Senate. Yes. Senator Rudy Purpage, Representative Irv Anderson. Heavyweights. Big guys, big guys. They were the recruiters. They were the recruiters. Okay. They had come up to find somebody to run against a man named John McKee, whose daughter, Mary McKee, had married a young up-and-coming state senator named Wendell Anderson. Okay. They, these three people believed that next door to the John McKee district, the Republican senator was vulnerable. They did not tell me this at the time, but they didn't think that the man I was running against, John McKee, was vulnerable. Okay. They believed that the man next door was, and they didn't want John McKee to use his funds to assist the man next door. Okay. They wanted to keep John I busy. Said busy. Yes, okay. And they believed that, that, that I could do that. Okay. And I could win. I might win. Yeah. It's always possible. Yes. So, but they didn't fully share their pessimism about my winning okay. with me. They did tell me that, that they wanted me to run. Okay. I was what, was what people call a self-starter. Mm -hmm. I really did want to do this. Yes. I told them, though, that I had two problems. One, I didn't have any money. Uh, I, I wasn't paid that much as a junior professor at Bemidji State. Yep. I, had no, I had no discretionary income. Right, yeah, after the family. Yes. They said they could take care of that. Okay. They would have caucus fundraisers. They would provide me with startup costs. Yeah. And then I said, I don't know how to do this. They said, we'll re we, we, you come down to St. Paul, we'll show you how to do it. Okay. I came down to St. Paul, and they had people who had won, won in rural districts, somewhat similar yeah. to mine, who showed me and told me what to do. Vernon K. Jensen from down in Montevideo, a veterinarian who had won down there, he was one of the lecturers. Yeah. They also gave me a pamphlet a little booklet prepared by a wonderful woman who is recently deceased, Lois Mizuno. Yes, right there. And, and, and Lois Mizuno, and the front said, walk, walk, walk. Yes. Yes. So knock, I came knock, back. Knock, knock, knock. Knock, knock, knock. <laughs> and keep, keep, keep moving, keep moving. Uh, I, 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 was, I, I was told to go up there and that I would walk, I, I canvassed Bemidji twice, I canvassed uh, uh, Black Duck twice, Baudet twice, I went to the Woodworkers Union up in International Falls, yeah. and, I, and, and Irv Anderson took me and said, this is the guy <coughs> we're going to campaign for up yeah. here, and, uh, and, and he said to me, you do whatever these guys tell you to do. Okay. Yes. And so they would go out w outside the factory uh, entrance, the uh, where paper mill, and they would stand next to me. The union organizer yeah. would stand next to me. And I would shake hands mm -hmm. with everybody coming in. Well, Gene, eventually you won, and I wish if we only have seven minutes, and we have 30-some <laughs> years of your life, which uh, we haven't broached yet, um, you were successful. And yeah, I buy about 150 votes because yes. John McKee did nothing, and I worked like crazy. Yes, so that's all right. And, and you remembered the the importance of working hard as a 
child. That's right. Dad, I'm sure, was very proud. I still proud. kept doing that. Uh, one accomplishment you'd like to mention while you're a senator, and then we're going to jump to uh, Commissioner Mamangi. I was given the uh, task of carrying the uh, education part of the Minnesota miracle in the Senate. Huge, very historical. It was, it was. Uh, there, I, 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 I was able by, by chance, well, this can get, uh, Senator Popham, Wayne Popham, had yes. the Citizens League bill. Yes. The Citizens League bill was very similar to, to what Wendell Anderson uh, 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 pushed later on as yes. the Minnesota Miracle. I was defeated by one vote. Yes. That was my high point of my legislative career. I moved what we call the governor's bill. Yes. Stanley Holmquist and Wayne Popham crossed the line and voted for the bill. It left Senate Education Committee. It went to the floor. Yes. It lost on a 34-33 vote Oof. because that was the lineup at the time. Yeah. They had a one-vote margin, the Republicans did. But because it had passed through the Senate Education Committee, it got into the mix, and in that long, long, long special session, yes. it became part of the compromise, and that became part of, of what really created, a from 1972 to the present time, mm -hmm. a, an arrangement in Minnesota that said, no matter where you go to school in the state of Minnesota, the state is going to see that you get sufficient funds so that you get a quality education. Wherever you live in Minnesota, you get police and fire protection and that basic fundamentals of municipal government because of local government aid. Now, now a great deal of that is being challenged. Well, it will be, but uh, it's very helpful to remember why this was done. and. I commend you, congratulate you for being a part of that major milestone. I was milestone in the right place history. at the right time at one occasion. Right. Good. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, you discontinued your service in the Senate. <laughs> yes, I was discontinued by being defeated in '72 by another Democrat, Jerry Willett. Yeah. Um, those things happen, but they happen. Uh, I think better things. Uh, eventually, well, you you moved to the Twin Cities. Uh, you became the Republican governor, Arnie Carlson's commissioner of education. Uh, how'd that happen? Well, this is in a way a kind of a sad story. Politics sometimes does odd things. The Minnesota Education Association, I was their, I was their lobbyist. Yes. Minnesota Education Association was, was disturbed by Rudy Perpich's leaning in the direction of providing more aid to private schools. Yes. Some of the this was a core issue. Uh, the same man who helped create, uh, who helped recruit me and a man who I admired a great deal. Yes. We came out against him because Arnie Carlson took the position of being opposed to an extension of aid to private schools and because that was such a core issue, we supported the MEA supported Arnie Carlson. It was Absolutely. very important yeah. to Arnie Carlson to get a liberal group such as that to yeah. support him. A lot of people may not remember that the union uh, has supported Republican well, that, as well, but it was a core That's right, that's right. So, so I, I, I think that I knew Arnie Carlson. Yes. I had talked to him occasionally. He was a person that the MEA supported when he ran for auditor. Mm -hmm. he, he liked the New Deal. He, and, and occasionally we'd run across each other and we'd talk about history. Yes. So when it came time to name his commissioner of education, he knew me. He, and I can't say this for sure, but I think he felt somewhat of an obligation to the yes. teacher organization, so he got two things at once. He named somebody he, he knew mm -hmm. and, and he also fulfilled this. Okay. And so I became commissioner and I served there for two years and nine months after that. Which one, uh, time, one accomplishment, 30 seconds on being commissioner that you'd like to reflect on. I was able to travel around the state and be a public relations person for something that I believed in so very much. Mm -hmm. It was a great opportunity 
to talk about teachers and the things that teachers do. Gene mm -hmm. Mamengate would never have had the kind of life that I have had, had not that been for first grade, second grade, third grade, all the way through. Teachers who, who gave me the sense that I was capable of doing almost anything that I chose to do. Right. The public school system, I lived in the working class part of Oregon, yes. Illinois. Yeah. I went to school with the judge's son, the merchant's son, yeah. the important people who joined mm -hmm. the athletic, the country club. My yeah. father didn't have time to join the country mm -hmm. club. I loved the public education system and the yeah. idea of being able to, to be the spokesperson for it for two and a half years or so was, mm -hmm. was a great honor. And, and Jean, uh, your dad who works seven days a week, uh, and here you're, you're 80, you could have retired years ago, you're still working, you're still teaching. Uh, I, yes, <laughs> I am still, I believe in that ethic today. And, well, and you teach at? I teach at Anoka Ramsey Community College. Yes. Community colleges perform a very vital role in the educational okay. system. We provide an entryway to people to experiment with post-secondary education, yes. and I'm proud and pleased to be And I know you've inspired so many students, and, uh, and your, your spouse, your better half, Char Brooker. Uh, Char Brooker is extremely active in, 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 as a volunteer in the environmental movement, and I'm proud of the work she does uh, as, as, as a volunteer and receiving uh, no compensation, yes. but working for the Isaac Walton League, a small group of people, but a group of people who has a substantial influence in, 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 in legislation here because uh, of the time that they give to that. Well, we are so appreciative of you, both of you are in Maplewood that you give back and concluding advice for our viewers, Jean, sum it up. It is impossible today for a citizen who is, takes any interest in, 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 in what's happening in the world, it is impossible to not get involved in directly in government. Our very future in terms of health care, uh, in terms of education, people, I tell students, and I believe this to be true, yes. think about what you believe in, become active in a political party. Yes. I believe in that and find out whether you're a Republican or a Democrat and then get involved. Excellent advice and Gene, thank you so much. What a great move from Oregon, Illinois to here and we appreciate the major contributions you've made not only to the Maplewood and to the region but to the whole state and your major impact on Minnesota history with the Minnesota Miracle. Thank you for joining us, Gene Mamagee. You're welcome. Viewers, if you have questions, comments that you'd like to have uh, re resolved or we can look into further, give me a call at the state capitol, 296-6820, or call me on my cell, 770-0283. We again want to thank Gene Mamagay for joining us, and I inspire you to do whatever you can to live the type of life he has to get involved. For your capital, what's up? I'm Chuck Weger. Thank you very much for watching.